just going to kick off by asking our four panelists, Dirk, uh, Lindsay, Melissa, and Bobby, to introduce themselves and their projects so we kind of have a sense of what they've been up to, what they're passionate about. And then we're going to try and get into a little bit about values. We talked about values this morning and what's valuable about their projects. And I hope that will then lead us into an interesting discussion about innovation. Um, and what they think innovation means in relationship to their work, which in turn hopefully will inspire some thoughts from you about what you think about innovation and is it important, if it is, why, and what are the preconditions for it happening and why might working transnationally be a good thing, particularly across Europe, to enable it. Okay, um, is that okay in terms of, of a, an ag a, a, a kind of deal about the next hour and how we spend it? Um, it, it'll be kind of fairly free-flowing, I hope, um, but I will be opening it up to you to make comments, suggestions, and also ask questions um, once we've heard from people. So I think probably without further ado, um, I'm going to ask people to speak. Um, I'm going to ask Dirk to kick us off, if that's okay. Um, Dirk, over to you. Yeah, my name is um, Dirk Neltner. I'm based in Berlin. And Platform Shift Plus is a project um, live theater for, um, from 10 European theater companies and one university. Um, we are from nine European countries, and the leading organization is um, here from UK, pilot theater company in York, and Lucy over there is a representative of pilot today. Platform Shift, um, they, the partners are all theaters for young audiences. And we are interested in um, what kind of theater is needed in that digital shift, in that time of, as I would say, um, a digital revolution we are living in. And we are not only keen to know how to use technology on stage, also how to use that technology in the communication to our audience, because theaters for young audience are actually only used to communicate via schools or parents to their audience. And we think, we hope, and more or less also convinced that with new technology, we are able to get into a direct conversation with our audience. And we have three main tools which we are using in our project. That is um, training programs via workshops and talks, TED-like talks in conferences. We call it creative forums. We have direct youth involvement, so participation work with young people, um, European gatherings of young people where we work th with them. And we are producing, we are co-producing for our audience and we bring that all together on festivals. Okay, thank you very much, Dirk. Can I ask Melissa to um, tell us a little bit about IFFR, please? This thing on? Yeah, it is. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa van der Schoor. I work at International Film Festival Rotterdam, where I am digital content manager and head of IFFR Live. Uh, IFFR Live is a project which has been supported by Creative Europe since its first edition in 2015. And basically it's a multi-platform, day and date, uh, transnational uh, project, which maybe sounds a bit futuristic, but um, uh, it has to do uh, with screening six films, which screen in Rotterdam during the festival. And then at the same time, these films are made available uh, to theaters across Europe and beyond, and also on video on demand platforms and on broadcasting channels. Uh, and um, uh, what's interesting is that um, we try to translate the film festival experience of watching a film together in the presence of filmmaker and cast. And we try to sort of expand on that uh, uh, by also letting people from all these other platforms and on these other locations join in on the conversation afterwards, after they have seen the film. So they can send in their questions through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, but also WhatsApp. 
and then they appear uh, on this uh, on the screen in uh, Rotterdam, where a moderator asks them to the, ask the, ask these questions to the filmmaker and cast. So you can have a sort of a conversation, whether you're watching the film uh, on a VOD platform in Singapore or uh, in a cinema in Barcelona. You can all all join in on the conversation with the filmmaker uh, in Rotterdam. So. Uh, and for the, during the first three years of IFA for Life, we've screened uh, 16 European films. Uh, and uh, with that, we've reached around uh, 20,000 uh, cinema visitors and uh, 3,500 uh, VOD views and uh, uh, approximately 240,000 uh, broadcaster viewings. So uh, uh, it's something which is growing and uh, something we will definitely uh, expand uh, upon next year as well. Moving then left to you, Lindsay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Creative Hubs, please? I would be delighted. Um, yeah, so I'm Lindsay from the British Council and I'm here just to speak a little bit about the European Creative Hubs Network, the longest name in the world. Um, it's a two-year, £1 million co-funded project with Creative Europe. Um, and it was set up to um, support the development and sustainability of creative hubs across Europe. Um, also allowing for connections, collaborations, and really to, I suppose, elevate the invaluable nature of this really kind of fast-growing ecosystem um, of creative hubs and to kind of showcase that to policymakers and high-level stakeholders. Um, but I suppose I should start by just very quickly saying what we mean by the words creative hubs, because it's quite a nebulous term, what the, what the hell does hub mean, um, creative hub. But we, what we mean by it is a space that brings creative people together. So whether that's a virtual space, being an online network or a physical space, it can be as small as a cooperative or a collective or as large as a physical building. It can be sector specific, so it can be a building with 200 tech startups, or it can be cross-sectoral, which is normally what we kind of focus on, a creative hub that might have designers, architects, illustrators, musicians, you know, DJs, everything in one space, learning from each other. And over the last 10 years, this kind of really fast growing, I suppose, community of creative hubs across the globe have, be have become really quite um, important in developing our creative economies. Um, and we, there's now, I think, an estimation of 1.2 million people working in creative hubs globally now. So it's, it's a really untapped resource and it's something we should be working with more. Um, and it's probably due to the fact there's a lot of kind of industrial buildings um, that have been lying derelict that are now being reused by creative hubs and they're turning them into new spaces and regenerating areas. So very quickly, um, the European Creative Hubs Network programme is a consortium of seven creative hubs across Europe from seven different countries. Um, it involves a variety of activities. There's forums which bring over 150 creative hubs together. Um, there's workshops that bring kind of a smaller number of people together to look at how to set up your business, how to future-proof your business, how to meet an interesting or innovative business model around Creative Hub. And then we've got toolkits, networks, an online network, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. There's research and some policy papers we're working on at the moment. And we're just past the halfway mark, um, and we've had just we've worked with over just over 300 Creative Hubs from across Europe and the Middle East and North Africa. Um, uh, I think it's totaling just over 32 countries. Um, and I think that's enough for me. Fantastic, Lizzie. Thank you very much. Um, Bobby. Um, I mentioned in my little uh, short presentation that we had a big moment of inspiration where we changed our business model radically, um, going from a large library to a small library. Um, but that was very, very fundamental and very scary because when we did it, um, we were basically running out of cash. I mean, we were really, really in trouble. And, in the, well, we weren't in trouble, but we, were, we, we had to focus our minds. So, and, you know, they say that creativity comes with a brief and a deadline. And when the deadline is the cash in the bank, it really focuses your mind. And, and that really, really helped us. Um, but it's not the whole story because, you know, I guess what I want to say is that the process of innovation takes time. And um, you have to make a lot of mistakes. So, you know, we have a, a theory, we move fast, we break things, we see what works, we iterate and we move on. And we apply that to everything we do, whether it's the technology, which is a huge part of what we do. I cannot stress enough, 
a lot of people ask me, they say, okay, wow, Mubi's 10 years old, that's incredible. We're the only purely independent global film platform that exists. How, you know, how did you survive? And it's like, well, we made a lot of mistakes. And um, when we saw things that worked, we tried to iterate on that and, and, and build on that. And you know, I, just, I, I think the, tech, the technology part of it is a huge piece of it. Um, people from traditional um, entertainment backgrounds are launching um, digital platforms all the time and they fail. And one of the key reasons they fail is they do not recognize that when you're distributing in that environment, the quality of your technology, the bar is so high that unless you do it yourself, unless you control um, all of the, the streaming and, and, and the product and all of the things that go into you know, building the, the space, if you will, um, you won't be able to keep up with Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Google, Mubi, and others who are like setting the bar so high and the audience consumer expectations so high that you really need to be there to be in the game. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Bobby. Um, I think that's pretty clear. And then you, you use this word iterate. Um, I'm, I'm taking that to mean where you kind of reflect on on that and therefore you at least momentarily slow down. And then, yeah, and you, can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, well, iteration is essentially building on what works. So okay. it's, it's, yeah, quite simply, it's like seeing what's working and, and taking it further. Um, exploring boundaries, you know, that's something I think, again, Creative Europe uh, specifically helps digital companies in the film and the entertainment space to do. It's to explore the outer boundaries of what is possible and through that, you know, it won't always work, but sometimes, you know, you find little things and, and like all, I guess, creative endeavors, it's often the last thing you expect that, that works and that's the thing. And then you have to glom onto that and, and build more on that. So. Fantastic, thank you. So, okay, um, I, this kind of leads on to my next question, which is really about what, what, what was valuable um, about working with partners in other countries, in other languages, in other systems, working within other structures. Um, could you have done all this just by having other partners where you were? Um, and if not, why not? So that's my next question that I'd like you to just give us a couple of minutes thought on, please. I much more like to speak about values than about uh, making money out of it. Um, and maybe that is one of the biggest difference between the movie sector and performing arts. Um, at least it's my point of view because I'm from Germany, a country where culture is very much um, supported, granted by the state. And it is one of our biggest issue that theaters, in my example, getting a huge support. All of our companies in Platform Shift are supported um, yearly by their states. And we are producing for young people. Young people are nowadays um, via internet, via the social media, always global in contact with other young people. It's for them quite normal. Theater actually is, in the, at least in the past, very much based in the region. And we have the idea that we can learn a lot from young people. And if our audience is already a globalized audience, then of course we as a makers of performances should work on the same level as our audience. And that's why for me there is no doubt that we need these kind of um, grants as Creative Europe is to lift up our artists on the same level as the audience already. That's a huge value, to be able to bring artists together that they can go into an exchange that they can learn from each other and do a very normal training program only by meet each other and find 
working inspirations. Theater in the past was always an institution organization reflecting reality of the audience. And that was for me today so interesting listening, listening to, to Ruth McKenzie talking about her Holland Festival and that so many productions were reflecting on democracy. We got the same um, experience. We had this June a festival of seven of our co-productions in Dresden, Germany. All of them reflected the political situation. And I'm coming from, from um, a generation, um, not saying that I'm one of the 68ers, but I was very much influenced by that generation, where political theater was a big issue. And I missed that for a very long time, that artists um, reflecting the world and giving a, their view, their attitude to the audience. And I was so happy to see that it doesn't matter where they are from the companies, from former East Europe or um, um, from UK or Germany. All artists wanted to reflect on that, what's going on nowadays in Europe, where are um, advantage and disadvantages of technology, how much we should be involved in these processes. And that was without saying them, you should do it. So in our co-production, we are totally open. We, we, we only say you have to find a partner with, among that group um, to co-produce, and we will give you the money that you can um, invite artists as they would be artists from your region. And then a deadline where we all want to share that, and that are our festivals. And the more surprising it is, that there were these kind of reflections. And I think that is also another value of that what's going on, that we have to react on the things. And this morning we talked a lot about Brexit, and we were advised not to talk about it. And, um, but I think we should talk about um, our, the enormous, um, power of artists when they are reflecting the world and we offer them the platform, the stages to do it. Yes, thank you. Um, um, it, it's, it's refreshing uh, also for me that, that politics and, and art are no longer uh, in uh, separate boxes but almost in inevitably and inexorably combined. But also this relationship between artists and audiences seems to be a, a theme that I think is emerging increasingly. And, and that kind of um, reflection, but also dialogue, and the different ways in which, and we'll come to this, technology is, is shifting and changing the nature of those conversations and the way in which artists think about making work maybe by, with, and for their audiences. Um, thank you very much. Um, Melissa, can I ask you to talk to the same question, uh, really about values, um, um, which Dirk uh, very sensibly reformulated rather better, um, in relationship to your project and what matters and what's important? Uh, I think um, about regarding values, um, it's also the innovative part I th uh, is maybe not necessarily technology related. Uh, um, with IFA for Life, the innovative part has also got to do with the way, uh, with the new kinds of partnerships we formed during the project. Uh, we started with a very uh, flex or for a very rigid uh, partnership where we said, oh, we're going to work with these three sales agents and then we're going to find the uh, X number of distributors and then we're going to release these films in these and these territories. Of course, when we were actually working on the project, we bumped into all kinds of issues and then of course uh, had to um, recalibrate our uh, expectations but also the way we worked. 
Um, so in the end, we um, uh, had to uh, find new ways of getting these films into, uh, into these theaters. And uh, that's uh, when we uh, started working with, uh, with Madeline, who, who you all saw this morning, um, from Europa Cinemas. And uh, we started to get in touch with these cinemas directly. And for us as a festival, that was very um, special, actually, because, of course, we... Uh, we work with cinemas in uh, Rotterdam, but never outside, of course. So, um, and all of a sudden, we were in touch with cinemas in Poland and uh, in Spain, and they were all very enthusiastic, enthusiastic about the idea that they were not necessarily um, dependent on the films that were chosen by distributors in their countries for them, but now they could actually pick films themselves uh, from our lineup, and that for them they felt really empowered and for us it was very exciting as well because they brought all sorts of different creative aspects to the table as well. So some of them uh, decided to uh, organize a whole festival around uh, uh, Eye for Far Life films. So they uh, selected films from our previous lineups as well and uh, it's very exciting to see and then, then there was also a festival or a, an, an art house in Ljubljana, for example, who decided to do like a Dutch festival uh, around the the Eye for Life screening. So each of these theaters brought their own expertise and also their own audience. And uh, for us, that was very surprising uh, as well. It's something we totally didn't set out to do, but it's something which happened naturally. And uh, for us, that was very you know, innovative, but also very valuable. Thank you. Yeah. So, so um, uh, it's interesting that, that you talked about the set ways in which you had originally imagined the project, uh, and that and that actually, it's good to hear that 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 you found there was enough space within what you were doing to respond to um, different things and possibly better things, uh, and that in fact you went on a journey that you didn't necessarily know uh, beforehand where you were going to end up. Um, yes, you have some firm objectives in mind. But it goes back to what Dirk was saying about values. If the values, and what we heard this morning, if the values are well aligned across the partners, actually the direction can shift and change. And uh, you kind of surrender yourself to a collective process. Um, uh, and then hopefully you, you work with what has arisen out of that, uh, which wasn't necessarily what you were expecting, but nonetheless has value. Good, okay. Um, I'm imagining it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm curious as to say wh whether this is something that you can also talk about or whether because you're working at a slightly different structural level, um, there's another kind of way in which innovation has to happen for you or in which um, you start to get into these issues of value. What do you think? Yeah, I think, I think um, yeah, I've not being one of the partners of the project or um, kind of advising on the project, I think the innovation within our project itself are the hubs because they have such different business models. Um, they're also different, it's almost like fingerprints, no mid business model is the same. Um, and just kind of linking that with values. I mean, I used to run a creative hub before I went to British Council and the big issue I had was not connecting with other hubs elsewhere. And we were running quite a unique hub at the time. There was nothing like it in Scotland, but we knew there was some in other countries internationally. Um, but w we never had time to put our head up above the parapet to find them and Google them and look for them and search for them. Um, and I think in terms of value, I mean, even if you ask everyone in this room what, you know, what, what, where they live, Every, or where they come from, everyone's got a different answer, and that, that brings diversity in itself. I think, I think Ruth McKenzie mentioned the idea of we're going to have this kind of monocultural society, and I think a project, you know, working Creative Europe provides the opportunity for us, any country, to connect outside of itself. Um, I think, you know, when you look at different continents, they all have very different complex natures. You know, for instance, creative hubs in sub-Saharan Africa, there's lots of tech hubs, but there's not a lot of creative hubs. And for someone to actually um, kind of grow as a business, they have to put up a year's rent to get an office space. So if the creative hubs were supported in sub-Saharan Africa, a lot more creatives would be able to get us an office space, because right now that's a major difficulty. 
Whereas, you know, in places like East Asia, you know, the Vietnamese government shut down hubs because they felt it was, it was this rising of, of I don't know, um, a, the kind of power against the government, a voice against the government. Creative hubs in the UK have been looked upon sometimes as a luxury events program. But in fact, they're, you know, regenerated in lots of really dark areas within cities or out with cities. Um, and when you look at countries across Europe and how they've adapted, you know, their hubs to their, I suppose, environment and the complexities of it, that's where the innovation comes because they're all so different. You know, they might be networks, they might be small, they might be large, they might be city bound, they might be urban, uh, rural bound, they might, you know, be social, they might be for social good, they might be commercial. But actually bringing everyone together that runs those different business models is really important in this project for them to kind of feed that cross cross fertilization of ideas and, and opportunities because if we just like Ruth and everyone else has said if we just talk to the same people all the time we're just all going to make the same thing and that's what makes the project unique is that everyone's talking to different people with very different perspectives and businesses so um, in trying to understand how this how this works am I right in thinking that because every hub has a different business model and presumably consists of different kinds of components. Everybody that comes, comes with a full expectation and understanding that they're not going to meet themselves. They're going to meet something that is different and that they don't necessarily know what that is. Yeah. Um, um, I suppose I'm, I'm curious, um, we'll come to Bobby in a minute, but, but I'm curious to find out more about how you manage that practically uh, and where the innovation comes if actually differences are given and diversity is... Um, very much to the fore because it's very obvious that you're not, let's say, like my project, working with a group of theatre companies who all make professional touring theatre with learning disabled theatre makers. I mean, there are reasons why that kind of apparent homogeneity is necessary, which I can, I, I think, hopefully are fairly self-evident. But in a way, that's the, the opposite end of the spectrum to what you're talking about. And so I'm really curious to get into that sense of how it happens and how you curate that diversity in a way. But perhaps that's for the next question. Um, let me come to Bobby, and, and, and I'm really interested in that moment or that sense from your rather elegantly portrayed narrative of, yeah. of when you kind of realised that you, you needed to make the switch. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think, um, yeah, we, what we're seeing is there, there's a trend, and I actually wanted to also respond to something uh, Melissa had said. Um, very, very interesting, because, well, to, to part, and also to answer your question is that Film is like, uh, for, for, for an industry and an activity that is, especially the art house filmmaking world, the festival film work making world, uh, that's full of artists, such a conservative industry. It is really hard to break down these barriers. So to your point about, it was so interesting to hear about um, the sales agents and other dis forms of distribution being a real hurdle and a block to um, this sort of innovative practice. And so, so nice to hear because it, it fits with what we believe and what we're seeing, which is that these exhibition spaces, and in our case the consumers, are demanding this content, but the structure is not letting it come through. So um, part of that, you know, innovating and you know, come, ending up with something slightly different is simply responding to what consumers want and where they want it and trying to find a way to get it to them. I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but um, a good, again, using that example of, of going back to the music industry, I think this is a really good example of, of how this could play out in film. So really what I'm saying is that the, the barriers to distribution of content over time, I think, are going to melt away. And increasingly, the artist will be in greater control of their film, in the case of film, or their film content. And with the music business, um, again, in the same think tank I was in in Berlin, this woman was talking about rappers, like German rap, and how like German rap music was totally rejected by all the labels, all the major labels, and basically they, they totally had to do it on their own. And because they had the digital tools to do it, they, they had their audience networks, they knew people liked it, and they built and built and built till they became incredibly successful at reaching that audience and, and getting their music heard. And of course, you know, 
maybe it's a dirty word, but yes, of course, they became very rich as well doing it. They made a lot of money and, and gained a lot of power, both cultural power and financial power, by having the direct route to the marketplace. And I think that you know, this, this, this is kind of what we're seeing, is that I think you know, the, the big sales agents, the big distributors, they are stuck in a, in a paradigm that isn't really working anymore and that it's a great news story for people who create content. And I know it's not easy. I'm not saying, great, be a, be a, be a film producer, director, distributor, you know, digital marketing expert and all that. I'm, I'm not saying it's easy, but the opportunities are increasingly there and you're, you're increasingly able to get uh, directly to the market. So yeah, for us, you know, it, again, it was like, we were the kind of little guys, and we still are really in a lot of ways. Um, and that did force us to innovate. It did force us to think uh, deeper. But we were lucky because um, our passion is, and really what this is about, is, is great cinema. You know, we, we love experimental art house festival foreign language films. Everyone who works at movie, that is our passion. And it turned out that focusing in that niche turned out to be a good thing. So not only was it our passion, but it meant that we didn't have to compete against Amazon. We don't have to compete against Netflix. And, and what we think is happening is that as the market evolves, you're going to get like four scale, what we're calling like scale feeds. So there'll be Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Apple. And those guys have, will have the scalability to dominate um, entertainment, particularly filmed entertainment, globally. But then underneath that, you'll have hopefully thousands of movies and other, you know, kids programming, arts program, pro whatever it is. But lots of feeds and channels and scalable channels that f serve niches and give voice to various different, you know, interest groups. And you know, that could be as big or as small uh, as as they can be. And again, with the mission of in our case, we want that 10% of the market that we th think we could capture if we do really well, we want that one day to be 20%, but without giving up um, our DNA and our passion, which is these films you know, that, we, that we love. Great, thank you very much, Bobby. And in a way, you're kind of leaping slightly ahead in, in, in terms of the next phase of questions, which I'm gonna ask a bit later on, once I've opened things up to the audience, which is really to look ahead to the future. Uh, and think um, what, what your hopes are uh, in terms of some of the benefits of some of the innovations that your projects have enabled, um, some of the changes in terms of removing the barriers between the artists and the audience, let's say. Um, uh, but to look a little bit of future gazing, if you like. Um, but before I do that, can I kind of switch my glasses so I can see you guys a bit better um, and see whether you have any questions for our panelists or any comments that you'd like to make um, on our session. No, um, but Creative Hubs can be franchised, like, you know, Impact Hub, Better House, they're franchise models, um, whereby someone sets up a hub in London or in Berlin, other people want to use that model and then they almost license it out as a franchise. So there are franchise examples of creative hubs, um, but most, most creative hubs are very unique and, and um, independent. They usually, so the hub that I used to run, our funds partly came from say Creative Scotland, maybe Edinburgh Council, ticket sales membership and partnership funds, whereas the hub next door in Dundee had a completely different financial model because it was all part, it was all online as opposed to physical, you know, to a business model like the Trampery who they get quite a lot of European funding or they get some commercial funding. I mean, if you look to every single Creative Hub's business model, they vary quite, there, there will be similarities for sure, um, but they, they vary quite differently in the hubs on our um, program. Um, are all independent hubs. Um, so Better House, and they've got one in Berlin, one in Hamburg, I think one in Sofia. Um, Impact Hub, which started in London, there's now a really amazing one in Birmingham that's franchised um, the model, but it's doing really kind of really innovative stuff, doing kind of children's creches, and um, yeah, they're doing really amazing models. So there are franchise models, but largely they're independent um, models that are generated kind of grassroots up 
um, by maybe one or two people. Sometimes they only last two years, three years, four years. If they last longer, brilliant, but a lot of them reach burnout because they're, they're so misunderstood and kind of um, under-supported. So I would say that they're, there's franchise models, but not, they're not all franchises of each other. I mean, look, I, I do, I, I understand what you're saying, and it's, it is really easy when you look at the good stuff and say like, oh, it's so great, you can make your own stuff, and you can just, yeah, I, like I even said, it's, it, it's not so easy, and there still are significant barriers in, in all areas. I guess all I can say from that perspective is that it's just interesting to live in an interest, I know it's supposed to be a curse to live in interesting times, but it's amazing as well, because like, I don't even really know what the answers are. I'm just observing things changing all the time. And you know, to the point about music and how that's gone, I mean, I just find it fascinating that the music industry recovered from the, the massive disruption was to going back to live performance. So it, we're actually living through an amazing time for live performance. We actually now have finally seen so I said something about moving from physical to digi digital and ownership to access, but actually in the music industry, because they're ahead of us, I guess, in, from film, is ownership is coming back. Records now are outselling digital, you know, digital copies and stuff. So that's incredible. Like the artifact comes back. And it, so it all kind of like changes in a different way. So I, I can't like specifically address that problem because yes, it is always difficult um, to break through and get past these barriers. But you know, there are, there are, I guess, more routes are, have been opened up. So as bad as the algorithms are for like, because of course the algorithms feed the popular stuff, becomes more popular and it becomes harder. Like ask anyone who has a song on, on Spotify and earns like zero uh, royalties. It's not like an amazing, you know, answer to everything. Um, but, you know, there are technologies out there and there are places, you know, where you can go and try and access and, and break through. But I, I'm not saying it's easy. I know it's hard. Whilst the technology is changing, the access to understanding the ways in which artists can monetize, to use that word, is not yet clear. I think that's a wider, a wider societal issue whereby um, we are being... Uh, uh, encouraged to think that, that um, we can access a lot of stuff for free or at a very reduced rate, whether that's Uber, whether that's the internet, all kinds of different things. Uh, and whilst that shakes things up in terms of traditional ways in which stuff gets made and then gets engaged with, um, you're right, we haven't yet sorted out actually uh, how that benefits the original creators. Um, and the individual artist is... Um, uh, uh, either has to be a successful entrepreneur and not all artists are and nor should they be or they have to find someone who understands their work and will work with them and not rip them off and i don't yet think we're there i think we're still in this period of uncertainty and change whereby we haven't worked out how to do that and we do need institutions to take responsibility uh, and not simply tacitly quietly pass on some of their risk to the individual artists so i, I hear you Yeah, I think so. What, what, what we actually observed, because we're global and we, we're streaming films all over the world, and there's some territories where piracy is rife. Like, it is not at all in the habit of people to pay for content online. Like Turkey, for example, is a good example. And what we saw there was what we call better than piracy trend. So when you could like just go and buy a DVD for a few euros or a couple of euros in the market, uh, and see that film, you could pay a few euros to Mubi, right? And people were willing to pay, to, what we saw people were willing to pay. So, so basically, why is that? Because it's based on the quality of the experience you give them. And this is where the good news comes in. So that sort of alchemy between really high quality uh, technology, really beautiful design, and the human element, the curation, the, 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 the thing of like, someone with knowledge has chosen this and explained why they've chosen it. Those things, in our experience, combine so that people are willing to pay. Um, they're willing to pay to avoid the hassle of getting a virus or whatever. And I think that that's the game, really. I think 
um, we will never stop piracy. The fact of digitization means it's all going to be out there. And as you said, eventually you're going to be able to just get it like that perfectly. So the only way to fight against that is to look for models and, and you know, um, experiences that will be worth people's while paying for. And so that, that's, I think, the answer to piracy is give a quality experience that people are willing to pay. I think it's happening already. I mean, this is why you see, like, it's incredible how many... Um, Eddie was just saying there's, like, a couple more cinemas opening up around here. Um, you're seeing these cinemas, but they're all, like, premium. It's always, like, a premium product, right? So it's kind of like a cinema with a bar and a restaurant or whatever, which, okay, it, it is what it is. But I think providing, yeah, that space, because the two things a cinema can give you that you can't have at home is a more immersive experience and the act of sitting alone together in the dark and watching something. And you can never really have that at home. So I think that will continue to exist and thrive. But there are still really big problems with the volume of films that are being made. And, you know, just like if you take a brand that I used to love, a, a cinema I used to love is the Everyman Cinemas. I hope there's no one here from that. But um, Everyman has completely lost its value to me because Everyman now is a mainstream cinema. I mean, the Everyman Cinema was represented something like what Rich Mix is, and now it doesn't anymore. Why is that? Because I guess they couldn't sustain, they couldn't, you know, the, the economics of showing these kind of films, um, experimental artistic films, didn't work for them. But I think that's really sad. So my worry is, in that space, like, will we be able to fill, you know, the space? I wonder, in terms of vinyl sales, how much money is actually finding its way back? into artists' pockets. I suspect that it's relative to the overall collapse, uh, relatively, of that kind of way of, 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 of purchasing music. Um, and certainly the revolution that's happened in the music industry is, is enormous uh, in terms of the institutions uh, who are now having to completely rethink their business models um, at, at an enormous level. Um, we have about five minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna ask for sort of concluding thoughts from our panel, if that's okay. Thoughts about the future. Um, I think, or I believe, that um, artists are doing their job to find um, a better understanding for themselves. So that means identity. And I think um, we are doing it to create something like a European identity with that international work in Europe or a global identity. And there is my hope in the future that, that we will have um, places, we have, will have resources, and hopefully also we will have in the future um, British um, partners to, to go on to create these global European identities to help people because I'm very much convinced that artists are very important to shape a better future. Uh, thoughts for the future? Well, I think um, it would be, uh, it's essential actually to have organizations such as Creative Europe uh, giving us all the opportunity to pioneer and to experiment and fail sometimes, but um, in order to learn and to become future-proof, we need to have this space. So I think uh, support from Creative Europe and uh, other organizations such as Creative Europe is uh, quite essential and for us uh, all uh, becoming future-proof. Thank you very much. Lindsay. Um, I'm all about communities, um, as you can see, Creative Hubs. Um, and I really do think the future is to just con to talk to people that aren't, you know, that are that are in different countries, that are doing different things, that are coming from different complex histories. Um, I think collaboration is is best when I suppose it's all about experimentation, isn't it? It's freedom of experimentation, collaboration. I mean, the word collaboration means lots of different things to lots of different people, but I think the future is all about being able to meet new people and experiment. And I think Creative Europe really has helped, you know, hundreds of people in our project and in all of our projects combined to meet people they might not have ever met before and exchange and learn from and um, be helped by, 
each other. And I think with everything that's happening in the political arena right now, I think the best thing is community. It all comes down to being one big community and helping one another. So I'm all about community and experimentation for the future, because God knows where we're going next. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, yes, yeah, so, so um, one of the things that makes film so unique is that in order to make a film, you, you have to collaborate. So already in its, in its very essence, film is about collaboration. And um, I, I really took a lot from the keynotes today because I love that thing, like we're, we're European, and I would add another level to that to say that um, we're filmmakers. Um, we, we are part of a global community of passionate cinephiles. And one of the great privileges of doing what I do is being able to go to these film festivals all around the world, which was also reflected in the second keynote, and meet people and share this passion for the language of cinema. So yes, of course, the future is full of you know, difficulties, but also great opportunities. And collaboration and bring, coming together uh, is a key part of that, and that is the way to move forward as far as I'm concerned.